This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. This week's Changemaker is Scott Short. As CEO of Riseboro Community Partnership, Scott leads the change to break down barriers and bridge divides, working to ensure that your zip code does not determine your access to health care, economic mobility, and housing security. Under Scott's visionary leadership, Riseboro has made instrumental strides, stewarding over $300 million toward management and development of nearly 7,000 units of affordable housing and doubled its budget to expand critical community programming. Scott brings decades of on-the-ground experience championing holistic neighborhood-based solutions to some of New York City's most pressing needs. Scott, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Happy to be here. It's great to have you here. And let's just start by going over who you are and what you do. We've got plenty of time, and I really want to dive deep into what Riseboro Community Partnership does. But first, what originally drew you to the career in nonprofit working in affordable housing? I'm curious to hear how your on-ramp started. Oh, wow. Actually, yesterday was my 22nd anniversary at Riseboro. So initially got started as a project manager in our affordable housing development department and really got into it um, just through an interest in helping people and in giving back to this community of Brooklyn that had adopted me. And um, I'm I'm originally from the West Coast, from California, and uh, moved to Brooklyn around 2000 and found a a home that really resonated with me here um, and wanted to find a way to give back to the community and and help people who had needs for stable and decent and affordable housing. So I was drawn to Riseboro and Riseboro's mission, even though I had no experience in affordable housing development at the time, Uh, but they took a chance on me and I began uh, with a number of renovation projects that the Riseboro had acquired through various city programs. Uh, New York City in the 70s and 80s became one of the largest landlords in the city, actually the largest landlord in the city through a number of tax lien foreclosure sales that happened uh, during those decades of disinvestment um, as, as many businesses and landowners kind of left the city. The municipal government was left as the landlord of last resort and acquired hundreds of buildings, many of them in the neighborhood of Bushwick, which is the neighborhood where Riseboro is located. And the city was not terribly good at being a landlord, and many of the buildings had fallen into disrepair. So uh, they had developed various programs to return those buildings to private hands, um, mostly uh, through partnerships with nonprofits like Riseboro and to provide financing to help upgrade the buildings in exchange for an agreement to keep the rents affordable uh, over over a long period of time, usually at least three decades. So that's kind of how how I cut my teeth in the affordable housing world, working on those types of buildings and renovation projects, um, most of which had tenants in place who were living in very substandard conditions. And it was just very rewarding to see the impact of my work and Riseboro's work in changing tenants' lives and changing those buildings and giving people the foundation that they needed to make other positive improvements in their lives. So describe some of the neighborhoods. You mentioned Bushwick being one. Like, What are the rent conditions or what are some of the affordable housing challenges that you're dealing with right now? Yeah. So, I mean, the challenges have evolved a lot in the 22 years that I've been doing this. I think when I first started, uh, there are many of many of the neighborhoods that I was working in in Brooklyn uh, were not very desirable places to live and uh, rents were depressed, services were depressed. Um, as Brooklyn and New York City as a whole has kind of evolved over the last two decades, and become uh, more of a desirable place to live. The challenge has come from being one where where you're really looking to kind of stabilize a neighborhood and uh, create pillars within that neighborhood that that improve uh, both the housing quality as well as the 
overall quality of life for the neighborhood into a challenge where you're really fighting against the forces of gentrification and where your primary goal is anti-displacement and making sure that people who have made these neighborhoods home for generations in many cases and have contributed to all of the great aspects that make these neighborhoods desirable places to live are able to continue to live here and afford uh, rent and enjoy some of the the benefits that that come from uh, the urban development that that has happened uh, especially in a lot of the neighborhoods in in north and central Brooklyn that Riseboro does most of its work. You mentioned gentrification and anti-displacement. Are there other inequities that you are realizing as you guys go through um, and do development and you know are you confronting other pieces in that paradigm there? Yeah, I think another another major challenge that we confront is keeping people stably housed and stably supported in their communities as they reach uh, later in life and, and even end of life. I think um, so often in in gentrifying neighborhoods, it's the senior citizens and those on fixed incomes that end up having the hardest time uh, because they they have no ability to increase their incomes uh, at the same rate of change that you see inflation and rents and inflation in goods and services happening in a lot of these neighborhoods. Riseboro got its start as an organization focused on senior services. Uh, Our former name was the Ridgewood Bushwick Senior Citizens Council. And we started this organization out of a single senior center on Stanhope Street in Bushwick that we still operate to this day. And out of that single senior center grew the the very large multi-service nonprofit that exists today. But really that focus on seniors and that prioritization of older adults uh, is still very much a part of the, the fabric and the culture of Riseboro. So we do a lot of housing projects that are focused on senior citizens. We have a lot of services that attempt to create real supports for seniors, either living in our buildings or living at home in their communities, uh, whether that's providing case management services or assisted living services or home delivered meals or friendly visiting or for the for the more ambulatory seniors coming to one of our senior centers and, and having those social and recreational connections that are so important to a healthy life. Um, that That is an often overlooked challenge uh, that you see in gentrifying neighborhoods that Riseboro is very focused on, and that is how to, how to keep seniors stably housed in their communities. Are you only addressing the senior housing, or are there other components of providing affordable housing that you're doing? No, we really provide the full spectrum of housing for any population that has a need. So low-income families, about a third of our apartments are set aside for them. Probably about uh, 20% of our apartments are set aside for formerly homeless individuals, many of whom have needs beyond just stable housing, whether whether that is mental health issue or substance abuse issue um, or um, other types of challenges that can often get in the way of, of being stably housed. So we provide a bunch of supportive services that address um, different populations experiencing different challenges to housing stability and try to meet people where they are and and really um, really understand that that getting stably housed is that foundation that everyone needs to uh, make any other improvement that they need in their lives uh, from social mobility, economic mobility, it all starts with with safe, decent, affordable housing. Um, and so that that is uh, what we believe a, as a foundation to our anti-poverty mission, but it really extends beyond housing uh, to to encompass a comprehensive set of services that that help people improve their lives. How many units are you guys either owning, managing, or developing currently? So we currently own and manage about 2,500 units, and we have about another 5,000 units that are in our development pipeline. Um, and our, our 
strongest footprint is in Brooklyn and specifically in in North Brooklyn where we got our start. But we're doing projects uh, across the city now and um, working working both with New York City government and New York State government uh, as well as private partners uh, to try to uh, try to create affordable housing wherever we can. And as is consistent with the with the Riseboro philosophy, really surround that housing with a set of services and resources um, that can give give people the tools that they need to make other positive change in their lives. So it's not just housing for housing's sake, uh, but it's really about housing as a, a tool to help overcome poverty. That's an impressive amount of units in the pipeline. What are you trying to vision or dream for Riceboro as the CEO now? Do you have a, a certain number of units or um, how do you go about thinking forward? So I, I think what we have in New York City, and it's not unique to New York City, I think it's really a, a, a national problem, especially um, especially with, within urban areas, uh, is, is we have a housing crisis and a housing affordability crisis. And so I think... Um, I think we, as uh, as a nation, and especially in high cost areas uh, like those that you tend to find in the coast, but even extending to the Sun Belt and um, the Mountain West, and and many other uh, areas of the country that that have grown very popular, um, what we find is is just a need to increase the overall volume of housing production. And I think we we've, we've got an understanding of just how fragile the housing production system is when there was a disruption during the pandemic, um, and it it really you know only lasted uh, I would say about six months meaningfully um, with with all the government programs uh, that that came in to help help get businesses back to work. Um, we we were. Uh, we, we had a you know pretty minor disruption. Um, our our construction sites were back to work pretty quickly, but you saw with with some of the breakdowns in supply chains, and you saw with just that that short term disruption how much housing production was impacted on the back end. And I think we're still facing the effects of of that disruption that occurred during the pandemic in um, massive rent inflation and, uh, and, and a failure to, to build enough housing for the, the growing populations in many urban centers and, and many of the, the other areas that I mentioned in the country. Um, so uh, overcoming that, that kind of disruption and doing it in a, in a way that is thoughtful around how do we use the the tools of government to help make it easier for folks to build housing? Um, are, are really some of the challenges that I'm most focused on. And although Riseboro approaches it on a on a very grassroots level, um, in as much as we're we're building things project by project, I I like to use our projects uh, to to help move the needle in terms of uh, public opinion and public policy to show good models for how we can increase affordable housing production across New York City and, and really across the country. You are being very humble because you have an extremely innovative example of how you've done just that by adding more units with the conversion or the transformation of the JFK Hilton Hotel. Talk to us about that because I was very, very impressed learning all the components to that. And I, I'd like for you to share more details about that. Yeah, thank you. That is that is a very exciting project. Uh, we, we call it Baisley Pond Residences, and it is the first successful hotel to housing conversion that occurred under the state's Honda program, which was rolled out during the pandemic in response to the fact that many hotels were going underutilized and uh, and we wanted to find a way as, as a city to and a state to help repurpose those uh, to permanent affordable housing. 
So um, it was very exciting for Riseboro and our partners Slate to be the first ones to be able to really crack the code on on how to put together um, an innovative financing model, uh, find a a hotel that really worked under many of the restrictions that existed with it within the, the funding streams that we were using and really create a model that that we hope is rep- replicable and and what's very exciting about it is that it creates permanent affordable and supportive housing without the use of low-income housing tax credits um, low-income housing tax credits are the primary resource that affordable housing developers working with municipalities across the country use to produce affordable housing. And it's a very limited resource. And as construction costs and development costs have uh, increased with inflation over the past several years, that that resource has become even more scarce in terms of the total number of units that it can create. Um, We're dealing with a finite pot of money and each unit that we build these days costs more and more. So the net effect is we're, we're able to, to build fewer units using that tax credit resource than we used to. So we're, we at Riseboro are, are very focused on trying to find alternative models that can produce affordable housing without the use of, of low-income housing tax credits and tax-exempt bonds that often accompany those tax credits. Um, and so that that's one of the most exciting features of, of the Basley Pond project is that we were able to do it uh, with 501c3 bonds and with an operating contract from the city that helps support the folks that were exiting shelter into the permanent housing that we were creating. And I want to dig deeper into that conversion, but we have to stop here. Coming up in the next part with changemaker Scott Short, the CEO of Riseboro Community Partnership. Scott also shares some advice for incorporating new developments within existing communities. It's about building relationships in community, uh, and and that starts by showing up, asking questions, and and then really listening to the answers, and then be really being willing to shape your work around what you learn from those interactions. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.